This Lockheed P-2V Neptune is a big airplane in any man's language. With her two powerful engines and terrific wing spread, she can travel plenty far. For one her size, she certainly can maneuver. The P-2V Neptune is the first land plane developed and built especially for the Navy as a search and patrol bomber. Here's a plane that has the longest range and is the fastest and most heavily armed patrol and search bomber yet built. Look her over carefully because she's going to play an important role in the Navy's part of keeping the peace. It will be a part of the arsenal we'll have ready should an aggressor strike. The P-2V Neptune has a high mid-mount wing and is equipped with two Wright R-3350 air-cooled engines which supply over 5,000 horsepower for takeoff. It has a wingspan of 100 feet, a fuselage that measures over 75 feet, and its gross weight is 58,000 pounds. It carries a crew of seven men. A pared-down version of the P-2V Neptune, equipped with extra gas tanks, broke the world's long-distance non-stop record in 1946, when the now-famous truculent turtle hopped from Perth, Australia to Columbus, Ohio, a distance of 11,236 miles. This is the plane that is to carry out the patrol functions previously assigned to the PB-4Y2 and PV-2. It is designed to patrol and search a wide area around the Navy's bases and in advance of the fleet to detect enemy submarines and destroy them. And also to carry out mine laying, night torpedo and black cat operations, as well as to attack surface targets. To all these patrol bomber functions, the P-2V Neptune measures up better than any previous plane. Specifically, with a full heavy bomb load, it can cover well over 3,500 miles. On a straight patrol job with auxiliary tanks in the bomb bay, it can travel over 5,000 miles. We can get a good idea of what this means when we realize that Neptune patrols based on Guam could cover Wake Island, Tokyo, Manila, Rabaul, and New Britain. The Neptune cruises comfortably between 150 and 210 knots. It's nobody sitting duck. When the going gets rough, it can speed up to more than 260 knots, faster than any previous patrol plane. It's unusually stable and handles particularly well on one engine, a very important factor in a long-range patrol operation. An important new feature of the Neptune is the Vericam tail, a new type of adjustable stabilizer. This mechanical device for varying the curvature of the horizontal tail surface facilitates trimming the plane in flight to allow for shifts in weight and center of gravity without requiring power-operated control. This makes for more efficient, stable flight and affects a fuel saving. And when it comes to firepower, the Neptune can really dish it out. Later models are equipped with six 20 millimeter cannon in the nose, giving it unprecedented offensive power. It also carries 16 high velocity aircraft rockets, eight under each wing, or twice as many as any previous patrol plane. For defensive armament, the P-2V has flexible twin mount 50 caliber machine guns in the dorsal turret, and two 20 millimeter cannon in the power tail turret. And inside its huge bomb bay, larger than that of any other patrol plane, it can pack a real wallop, 8,000 pounds of explosives, from 2,000 pounders down to depth charges, deadly aerial torpedoes and tiny Tim rockets. When a target is spotted, the Neptune can deliver an accurate and devastating attack. Even in a peacetime Navy, prompt recognition of a long-range patrol plane like the Neptune with its varied functions is extremely important. 
From a beam, the first distinctive feature of the P2V that strikes you, even at a distance, is the large, tall dorsal fin and rudder. The long, slender fuselage also stands out. The fin and rudder has considerably more taper to the leading edge, the trailing edge appearing almost straight. Its tip is rounded. The dorsal side of the fuselage is straight all the way, but the underside tapers up aft of the wing. The tail skeg on the underside of the fuselage aft and the radar housing below the fuselage slightly forward of the wing are other distinctive features of the silhouette. Significant also is the shape of the nose. On the earlier models, egg-shaped, but not symmetrical as in most planes. Later models are quite pointed, more like a fish's head. The dorsal turret and power tail turret behind the huge fin are also visible abeam. Check the main beam view features again. Large, tall fin, leading edge more tapered, tail skag, long slender fuselage, straight dorsal, tapered underside, radar housing, and pointed fish head nose. Now let's see the Neptune head on. The tail fin shows up. Overall appearance, clean, not too easy to spot. The mid-mount wing is rather high with most of the engine nacelles below the wing. The inboard panel of the wide 100-foot span is straight with dihedral on the outboard panel. Below the fuselage, the radar housing makes a telltale bulge. Take a good look as she comes in at higher speed. The P2V Neptune is really maneuverable. Its rate of roll is considerably higher than the conventional four-engine bomber and it has a high rate of climb for so large a plane. In plan, the long tapered fuselage and large wingspan stand out immediately. The wing is straight inboard. The outboard panels of the leading edge taper very slightly, but the trailing edge tapers considerably. The wing tips are rounded and so is the tail plane. The long slender engine nacelles extend far forward of the wing and bulge the trailing edge. Note the bulges are rounded, not pointed, as in many other multi-engined aircraft. As a beam, the dorsal and tail turrets are visible in plan. From below, the untapered nacelles are another distinctive feature. The Neptune has a very low stalling speed, around 80 miles. Improved Fowler-type flaps and overall design make it possible for it to land in short fields. It has tricycle landing gear. The cockpit is far forward ahead of the propellers, thus providing excellent visibility. For a big plane, the Neptune can land in a very short distance. And now that she's on the ground, we can see just how big she is. The Neptune has been built for comfort, with sound insulation, bunks, and a galley. These are important for planes assigned to tiring patrols lasting more than 30 hours. All the comforts of home as she takes off on a mission. See how easily she takes the air and climbs. For all its size and bomb load, the Neptune can operate out of a fighter field an important asset for a patrol plane this size. And its service ceiling is plenty high, over 27,000 feet. All in all, a good patrol plane from every point of view. There she goes, the P2V Neptune, the Navy's newest long-range patrol and search bomber. Take a good look, because you'll be seeing her often.
Well, I guess that about wraps it up for us. With any luck at all, he ought to be able to hold that contact until the carrier arrives on the scene and takes over. Andy, you've got to hand it to Saunders and his crew. They've done it again. Send them a well done, will you? Attention all stations. Uh, just received the following message from the skipper. To all officers and men, well done. Congratulations on completion of successful mission, end quote. Well done, Van Betten. All hands secure to battle stations for return to base. Well done, Van Betten. You've only been here a short time, and now you're a hero. Yeah, but look how long I've been at it. You haven't done so bad yourself. You didn't get to be crew chief just riding as a passenger. Well, it took me a while. Plane captain in Norfolk, then carrier duty. Now here at Jack's with the P2Bs. Navy Jack's Tower, Parkfield 392, approaching the break, over. Parkfield 392, left break approved. Call base. Jack's Tower, Parkfield 392, we'll call. Well, Parkfield should be on the runway by 1600. And that should be my last traffic for today. Dan, give me the landing checklist, please. Roger. Brakes. Check pressure up. Shoulder harness. Locked. And mine's locked. Bow observer. Bow observer reports that the bow is secured. Landing gear. Hold it. Landing gear is unsafe. Try it again. Still unsafe. Jack's Tower, Parkfield 392. My nose gear indicates unsafe. Request low pass for visual inspection, over. Parkfield 392, clear for low pass. Parallel runway 27. Do not descend below 200 feet. Remain well clear of living quarters and hangars. Jack's Tower, this is Parkfield 392. We'll call yellow pass instructions. Repeat, your nose gear is in a trail position. Jack's Tower, Parkfield 392, roger. Leaving landing pattern will attempt repair of malfunction. Parkfield 392, clear to leave the pattern. Remain this frequency. Saki, my nose gear is stuck in the trail position. Get forward in the nose tunnel and check it. Yes, sir, but I'll need another man to hold the safety link and pass the tools. How about Van Betten? Okay, take Van Betten and hurry. Roger, sir. And in case you're wondering, we have 45 minutes of fuel remaining. Roger, sir. A crippled aircraft with a 45-minute time limit. A true test of men against time. Oh, my aching back. Some place to work, huh? Now, buddy, your comfort's secondary. What's the matter? It looks like the actuating cylinder's foul. That bad? It ain't good. Look, there's no time to lose. Pass me that line in the report to the skipper. And then come back and help here. Yeah, but how long will it take? Tell him, with luck, about 45 minutes.
only a few minutes before, this plane's mission was in the hands of specialists, men like Van Betten. Now, the lives of 10 men, officers and crew, are in the skilled, capable, knowledgeable hands of one man, Waisaki, a specialist too. How did they come to be here? And what has prepared them for such challenges? They come from technical training schools throughout the United States, the largest of which is the Naval Technical Training Center at Memphis, Tennessee, headquarters for all Naval Air Technical Training. Here, more than 6,000 men and women work and train for proficiency in naval aviation ratings. These are the electrical and electronic technicians, photographers, mechanics, metalsmiths, aerologists, and other essential specialists of the Navy Air Arm. Those selected for this special training are the cream of the crop, physically and mentally. They are the personnel beneath Navy wings. First, two weeks of aviation familiarization. Firefighting. survival. A lot of fun in a swimming pool, but vitally important. Learning the right way to do things now may someday save a life. Yours. Hey, don't you swim at all? Yeah, barely at all. It takes all kinds, I guess. Do what? To make a Navy. Aircraft safety. The main thing to impress on you men is this. This propeller will kill you. Never turn your back to it. The feller has never lost a fight with a man yet. Any foreign matter that enters the jet intake can ruin $10,000 worth of engine. So keep your runways clear of pebbles or cigarette stubs. You get too close to the intake, we lose both an engine and a man. Firefighting, water survival, aircraft safety. They get it fast in great big chunks. Physical training after classes. Military training between classes. Marching to and from meals and barracks. On the line, a first introduction to real workable aircraft. Feet on the rudder, hands on the stick, eyes on the dials and meters. Set against this intense practical manual training is a wide background of academic theory. Long hours of bookwork. Study, study, and more study. Oh, can't a guy study around here? You know, sometimes you get to thinking. Well, that's an encouraging symptom. What's it now, thinking man? You know, there's supposed to be a reason for everything. When I was a kid, I always wanted to fool around with flying. Made models of all the planes. And from scratch, too. Not out of plastic, but out of paper and balsa. I used to see all the movies about flying in a world war in Korea. Boy, I used to say, that's for me. Someday I'm gonna fly. Other fellows my age were playing cowboys. Then later wanting to be scientists and lawyers and teachers. But not me. Then later with girls. They'd take them to a show or like that. I took my dates to the airport. So it figures when I get a chance to write my own ticket, I chose aviation. How else could I have made it? You're not off the ground yet. I will be, and I'm learning a lot of stuff, a trade. That's something a man can lean on. You got it all planned out, huh? Operation Wysocki. Step one, step two, step three. And why not? So I'm looking out for myself. Is there anything wrong with that? Who said wrong? You could have gone to college. Probably will. Anything wrong with that? And when I do, I'll be better prepared. Meanwhile, there's military service. Yeah. 
Every citizen has a duty to his country help keeping his nation free. Listen, man, you can stick with that big hero bit. Look, people have been serving one duty or another since Valley Forge and the Alamo. Why, ever since we had a country... Hero right? I am not. But here you are. Look, well, Operation Wysocki or Operation Van Betten, either way seems to have gotten us to the same place. Yeah. Funny, isn't it? Hey, now. What have we here? Very interesting. Connie Canandera, recent graduate of Controlman School at Olathe, Kansas, now assigned to the control tower, NAS Memphis, begins her on-the-job training. Well, that's one girl you wouldn't have to take to the airport. It's a friend of yours? Not really. Good. Because that's going to be Operation Wysocki, Step 4. Not really, but I'm working on it. Maybe I'll see you there. And so? Waisaki started to work on step four, Connie Conadera. How do you do, Miss Conadera? I'm Joe Waisaki, Socks for short. Hello, Socks. This picture certainly doesn't do you justice. <laughs> well, thank you. If uh, Van doesn't mind, I'd like the honor of having this dance. Well, all right. I'll be back in a minute, Van. You're a pretty good dancer, Connie. I guess I can thank dancing school for that. Dancing school? Well, I, I guess that's the way to learn. After some pleasant moments of diversion following their basic courses in air familiarization, the men start attending specialized schools for the various ratings. Van Betten entered the electronic school. Wysocki, the mechanical school for machinists, structural mechanics, and metal workers. First, they all learn what their instructors call respect for tools and materials and machines. Precision, cleanliness, safety. New ideas to many of them. Pride of workmanship, responsibility to design and end use. Waisaki knows it means something to get a nod from instructors that are the best of their ratings. Structural mechanics learn about ejection seats. Refrigeration systems. Metal working. Riveting. Punching. Welding and many more operations. Meanwhile, the mechanics learn about reciprocating engines. Helicopter engines. Jet engines, assembled or piece by piece. Okay, disassembly completed. Now, what's the count, Foma? We have the hydraulic pump, the drive shaft, accessory gearbox, fuel pump, and magneto. That's very good. Gordon, would you come forward and name some of the components? Structural and hydraulic mechanics get deep into everything from the plane's airframe to hydraulic controls and safety equipment. Landing gear down. Landing gear down. Resting gear down. Resting gear down. Speed brakes out. Speed brakes out. Rudder. Rudder. Elevator down. Elevator down.
Landing gear up. Landing gear up. You'll notice that as the main landing gear is retracting, the nose landing gear is extended. Now get this and get it good. There are two basic laws in aviation, the law of gravity and Murphy's law. The law of gravity states that what goes up must come down. Murphy's law states that if an aircraft part can be installed incorrectly, someone will install it that way. I've seen men work all night, working off a of bug, safety, or hydraulic equipment. You'd appreciate that if you were the pilot. For men that have chosen aviation, this is the great rock candy mountain. Week by week, closer to the kind of skill and knowledge that will qualify them as specialists at air stations and with the fleet. Every week, a class graduates, and students receive their assignments to stations on the east or west coasts, and the opportunity to put into practice all that they have learned. Well, what'd you pull? ASW Patrol Squadron. Won't be long, and I'll be flying with the crew. I might even make crew chief. You may address all my future correspondence to NAS Norfolk. Sure, Socks. I'll make sure that Connie writes. Oh, from time to time. Uh, thanks. Uh, watch out for her, though, will you? But not too close. Ah, uh, you can count on me. Uh, that's what I'm afraid of. <laughs> but seriously, I hope we all get duty at the same station. Especially with you, Connie. <laughs> now, fellas, Socks is shipping out tomorrow, so let's not waste our time arguing. All right, let's dance. <laughs> The graduate mechanics go to their next duty stations. Socks left for Norfolk, and Van Betten continued his schooling in electricity and electronics. After getting a good foundation in electricity and basic electronics, students move ahead into advanced theory and practice, from basic through complex systems, to solid state physics and the latest applications of transistors. And finally, specialized training with actual equipment Far out stuff most people have never heard of, built specially for Navy use. Some of it as highly classified as radar was 20 years ago. With equipment like this, anybody with electronics on his mind feels like a hungry man in a delicatessen with unlimited credit. By the time they're ready to graduate, they've been educated up to their eyebrows, as no other school could do in the same time. Won't be long now. Tomorrow's the big day, Connie. Graduation. Then I report to NES Norfolk. Oh, that's wonderful. You know, Sox is stationed at Norfolk, too. Yeah. But he's in a patrol squad and will eventually fly with the crew. Well, I'm attached to a fighter squad. No chance to fly. Now, Van, you know that a lot of ATs get a chance to fly, too. And besides, you still have to serve your apprenticeship. Yeah, I guess that's right. Come on, let's dance. You now are about to receive your diplomas, signalizing the satisfactory completion of your work here. Young men prepared to join the Fleet Aviation Specialists of the Air Arm, an elite service dedicated to maintaining the aircraft and missiles of the United States Navy in constant readiness. Yes, the opportunities for aviation-trained men and women in the modern Navy are many and varied. The enlisted personnel are well-trained for their exciting roles. From beneath Navy wings, they keep our pilots flying safely. Such rates as machinists mate, 
who is responsible for keeping the engines and other mechanical equipment of aircraft in perfect working order. Structural mechanic maintains aircraft wings, fuselage, tail, control surfaces, and landing gear. Electrician's mate keeps electrical mechanisms and wiring in operating condition. Training devices man operates, maintains, installs, and repairs training aids and devices. Electronics technician tests, maintains, and repairs all airborne electronic communications equipment, such as radio and radar. Ordnance man prepares naval aircraft for action by loading bombs, torpedoes, rockets, and guided missiles into planes. Fire control technician tests and maintains the complex equipment which fires the guns on naval aircraft. Air controlman provides assistance to naval pilots in landing and taking off their planes. Bosun's mate assists in launching planes from catapults and in landing planes on board aircraft carriers. Photographic intelligenceman maintains and processes air photo intelligence data. Parachute rigger has the highly responsible job of keeping parachutes and other aviation survival equipment in perfect condition. Aerographer's mate observes forecasts and distributes accurate weather information. Photographer's mate operates, maintains, and repairs the various types of cameras for ground, sea, and aerial photography. Aviation storekeeper procures stores, preserves and issues all types of aeronautical equipment and accessories. These are men and women who find exciting, worthwhile careers in the air arm of the United States Navy, who recognize the opportunity and challenge of serving their nation on the sea and air frontiers that are today of paramount importance to the security of the free world. And now, three years out of the classrooms at Memphis, Van Betten, Waisaki, and Conadera finally get that tour of duty together. And with it, another challenge to their experience and training beneath Navy wings. Those 45 minutes are about up. Just a little more, and we're in. This aircraft, thanks to a minor assist from you, is now fully operational. Here, try and put this pin in the stiff knee. Waisaki to skipper. The nose gear is down and in position, sir, but I can't get the pin in. Roger, if it looks good to you, Waisaki, we'll go ahead and try it. Jack Star, Parkfield 392, turning base. Gear now indicates down and locked. Parkfield 392, cleared to land. Runway 27. 392, this is a safety officer. Recommend you keep the nose gear off the deck as long as possible. Jack Star, Parkfield 392, we'll call. What do you know? They even have a band out to welcome us.
Brookfield 392 rolls out on runway 27 at 1643, 43 minutes later than scheduled, completing another routine mission. One plane, one crew of specialists, out of thousands that comprise naval aviation today. Ski Jump 2 was an aerial research mission dispatched to the far north early in 1952 by the United States Navy. This was the site of Ski Jump 2, where ice covers the Arctic Ocean and adjacent seas. The shortest air routes between Asia and the United States are the Great Circle routes over the Arctic, making this region important in the global defense of the United States. The purposes of Ski Jump 2 were to extend research and to perfect techniques started in 1951 by Ski Jump 1. The 1952 expedition sought answers to many questions concerning flying in the Arctic. For instance, what are the several large floating islands of the Arctic really like? Can they be of any use to the Navy? We want to know more about the Arctic Ocean, its depths and currents, its temperatures, salinity, and bottom characteristics. What types of ice are found here and why? How good are our techniques for operating heavy aircraft from nature's own ice strips? How will our latest ski wheel installation perform on natural Arctic ice fields? Under what conditions are skis necessary? The mother plane of Ski Jump 2 was a specially fitted Lockheed Neptune, a P-2B. It left Patuxent, Maryland on the 10th of February, 1952. This was the flying laboratory of the expedition, an R-4D, one of the workhorses of World War II. It left Patuxent on the same day. Two weeks later, the second P-2B took off from Patuxent. It would alternate with the first P-2B in serving as supply plane for Ski Jump 2. Seven days out of Patuxent, northern Alaska and the Brooks Range. Before aviation, this mountain range discouraged movement farther north in Alaska. Next day, Point Barrow. For uncounted ages, Eskimos have lived here. In the last three quarters of a century, however, Point Barrow has become important to the United States as an Arctic outpost for military and commercial research development. The first P-2B arrives over Point Barrow. It looks strangely deserted with the late day sun slanting over the lighted Quonset huts. Temperatures from 20 to 30 degrees below zero during this season keep most hands indoors. The P-2B comes in for its first landing at the Barrow airstrip. During the coming three months, one of the P-2Bs will be seen here daily. The P-2B is loaded with crew, cold weather clothing, spare parts, and survival gear. Let's take a look at Point Barrow, since the expedition will be based here. Here is an official Navy camp with a resident officer in charge. The camp is under the jurisdiction of PET-4, the Navy project for developing petroleum reserves in this area. Other Arctic research projects, including the Arctic Research Laboratory, a weather station, and communication stations are here. Thus, Point Barrow aids the military and commercial projects in carrying out the United States policy. It was planned to begin Ski Jump 2 by establishing several oceanographic stations in the general area of 76 North and 145 West. Small amounts of reserve fuel were to be cached at two of these stations. From a station having a fuel cache, flights could fan out to more remote oceanographic sites without having to return to Point Barrow for fuel. Such stations were to be equipped with a small radio homing beacon with a one and one half watt transmitter powered by a wind driven generator. The station was also to have a 500 gallon cell for the gasoline cache. The 10 mile range of the radio beacon was too short. 
a much longer range is needed because the ice moves constantly and the beacon is seldom where the pilot expects it to be. A square search is often necessary to find it. This consumes valuable time and gasoline. For this reason, direct plane-to-plane -plane fueling was adopted, and fuel caches were established for emergency use. First, however, many local flights had to be made before the expedition could leave Point Barrow. These were to familiarize the crew with the area, to acclimate them, and to uncover any cold weather weaknesses in the plains. This experimental landing strip is two miles offshore from Point Barrow. On one of the familiarization hops, a trial landing was made on this strip. Combination ski and wheel landing gear are seen here. In this type of landing, on smooth ice with a light snow cover, the skis are raised and only the wheels are used. It was not unusual to return to the Barrow airstrip after one of these local hops and find a new cold weather problem. These problems, ranging from minor leaks of various types to an engine change, resulted in a one-month shakedown period prior to beginning actual operations. Oil leaks were a constant problem, and they were hard to locate because it was necessary first to remove the congealed oil, a hard job in temperatures that dropped to 30 degrees below zero. Also traceable to the cold was the air fuel induction system fire that made this engine change necessary. Low temperatures caused hydraulic fittings to leak, clamps to loosen, and tools and materials to become brittle. Small tools snapped during normal usage. The mechanics usually wore light leather or nylon gloves and used Herman Nelson heaters to achieve some degree of efficiency and comfort while doing maintenance work. Even so, repair jobs took three to four times longer than normal. All maintenance facilities available at Barrow, such as this portable work shelter, were pressed into use. This was necessary because no special maintenance gear had been brought by Ski Jump 2. Finally, preparations are made to depart. Aircraft are fueled from 50-gallon drums by means of a portable gasoline-driven pump. To keep its weight down, each plane is given only enough fuel to complete its mission with a 2-hour reserve. Frost is removed from the wings with ordinary brooms. Engines are turned up for half an hour before takeoff. About 25 minutes are required to bring pressures and temperatures up to normal. Here, the R-4D takes off for the expedition's first day of actual operations. Since the P-2V has a faster cruising speed, it departs later than the R-4D, so that both planes will be over the point of intended landing at about the same time. Aviation crews, oceanographers, and geophysicists, 10 highly trained persons per plane, depart for the site of the first oceanographic station. Off Barrow, the planes fly over the shore lead. The Arctic sea smoke seen here is caused by relatively warm open water coming in contact with cold air. During all flights over ice, the pilots and scientists keep a log of ice conditions. One hour before the scheduled rendezvous, the R-4D begins transmitting homing signals. These are continued until the P-2V comes within visual range. Once the rendezvous has been made, a search will be started to find a suitable landing area. Ice thickness is indicated by its color, but it takes a lot of experience before one can estimate its thickness with any high degree of accuracy. The lighter R4D lands first. The first job is to check the thickness of the ice. This is a crucial moment, and the plane is kept ready for instant takeoff in case the ice is too thin. When the saw starts bringing up water, the ice thickness can be measured. To support the loaded P2V, it must be at least four and one-half feet thick. And the field must, of course, be long enough and smooth enough. This field passes the test, and the P2V is cleared for landing. Unloading starts, and the first oceanographic station gets underway. Survival gear is one of the first items out. Gasoline heaters are used, both to preheat the engines and to heat the cabin. Although these heaters are satisfactory, the fire hazard is a continuous threat. Survival equipment is placed some distance from the plane, just in case the plane catches fire or goes through the ice. 
After the engines are secured, banjo covers are put on for protection from cold winds and snow, and York heaters will be used to keep them warm. This auxiliary power unit, mounted on a sled, will be used as a source of electrical power. This 500-gallon neoprene gasoline cell will be filled and left as an emergency cache. The scientists begin collecting their data. Here, a geophysicist measures the force of gravity with a graviometer. About three hours later, with fueling completed, the P2V warms up for the return trip to Barrow. It will return tomorrow morning with fuel and supplies for the second oceanographic station. Even on this unimproved ice field, the big plane takes off without difficulty. Where, as in this instance, snow cover does not warrant the use of skis, normal takeoff procedure is used. It is now the following morning, and the P2V is returning to its rendezvous. The R4D gets into the air as soon as the P2V is sighted, and the two planes proceed to the general area where the second station is to be established. A suitable landing area has been found. The pilot sets the R4D down very gently, feeling out the surface. Should the ice feel unsafe during this run out, he would make a touch and go for further investigation. In this case, the pilot is satisfied with the condition of the ice and makes a full stop landing. Out comes the power saw for measuring the ice. It is thick enough to support the P2V. The P2V taxis close alongside for fueling the R4D. During fueling, survival gear is removed from the plane. The auxiliary power unit is set up and preliminary work is done to establish the second oceanographic station. Meanwhile, the oceanographers commence their work. This power-driven auger drills a hole through the ice so the oceanographers can collect their data. The shelter is then rigged over the hole and the doorway of the plane. Heat from the plane keeps the hole, the water samples, and the scientist's hands from freezing. At each landing, ice conditions in the general area are studied. Here, one of the pilots is approaching a rope pack. A rope pack is a kind of pressure ice, a pinnacle or slab that has been forced into an upright position, sometimes as high as 30 feet. Other types of pressure ice in the area form interesting patterns. These surveys train the pilots and navigators in estimating ice conditions accurately from the air. Ice crystals such as these often occur in the Arctic area. Certain combinations of atmospheric conditions cause sublimation, that is the change from vapor to solid, without going through the liquid state. And these delicate ice flowers are the result. Landings on natural ice fields are safe only during good visibility. On a bright day, even small snowdrifts are easily distinguished from the air. But in haze or overcast, ice and sky may blend together to form a whiteout in which no horizon is visible, and pilots might not be able to see a pressure ridge such as this from the air. The P2V prepares to return to Barrow. Normally, two or three hours are needed to bring the work of an oceanographic station up to this point but several more hours will be needed to complete the work. The first four oceanographic stations were set up in this manner. On the 26th of March, the P2V left Point Barrow to rendezvous with the R4D. The two planes then flew in company to the proposed site of the fifth station. Up until this time, all landings had been made on large areas of winter ice. That is, ice less than one year old, relatively smooth with little snow cover. It makes the most desirable landing sites on the ice pack. However, north of the fourth station, areas of winter ice suitable for landing became scarce. Therefore, an ice field more than one year old had to be used for the site of the fifth oceanographic station. The P2B gets ready to let down as soon as the R4D has landed. A radio message from the R4D advises that the area is rough. It is rough and the landing strip is too short. The pilot tries reverse pitch braking, but the plane goes into a sideways skid. Smoke pours out of the port engine nacelle. The R4D crew runs to lend a hand. Luckily, the fire is only a small one and is quickly put out. That reverse pitch didn't work very well. The left propeller went into reverse first and stuck there. The right would not reverse at all. This caused the plane to swerve 
skid sideways through the drift and damage the port ski. However, the bottom of the ski is not damaged, so a takeoff may be possible. The left prop has been restored to normal functioning, and the P2V is warmed up. Despite the damaged ski, the decision is made to attempt to take off. It works all right. Notice how cleanly the skis slide. They hold the wheels clear of the snow most of the time. This ski installation is the result of three years' experimentation and testing. One recommendation resulting from Ski Jump 2 is that this ski installation be accepted as a model installation on any large aircraft using tricycle landing gear. For ski takeoffs in the P2V, full flaps, full nose up elevator trim, and full power with water injection is used. Ski takeoffs are quite similar to seaplane takeoffs in that a definite hump speed is encountered. As soon as the aircraft becomes airborne, the elevator is returned to neutral trim. Once more, the P2B heads back to barrel, and the R4D crew and the scientists turn to setting up an oceanographic station. Next morning, during a takeoff, the R4D ran out of luck and struck a snow-covered ridge, collapsing the left landing gear. Shearing off the left propeller, and buckling the outer panel of the left wing. Point Barrow radio informs the maroon crew that rescue will be delayed several days because of P2V troubles. The crew immediately set up their survival gear and begin sorting out what equipment can be taken and what will have to be left behind. Instructions are received to clear a landing strip for the P2V. All hands help level snowdrifts and small ice hummocks. After the runway is smooth, it is marked with bright red flags. Never had any plane looked so good to the handful of men of the flying laboratory. A signal fire is started with burnable gear too heavy to be evacuated by air. The smoke helps the P2V to keep the spot in sight and enables the pilot to judge wind condition. Circling the area, the pilot comes down low and looks over the landing strip very carefully. He brings the P2V in slowly because this is a very short runway. He is holding the nose wheel off the ice to keep it from pounding and to increase drag. The strip is still not smooth, but compared to its condition when the first landing was made, it is much improved. Safely down, the big plane taxis back to the stricken R4D. It hurts to abandon this faithful plane, but it's the only practicable solution. The men in gear from the R4D are returned safely to Point Barrow. But now, with the loss of the R4D, the oceanographic phase is stopped. Two secondary phases of Ski Jump 2 remain. Investigation of the ice island, T3, and the ice survey of the area around Thule, Greenland. One P2V leaves Point Barrow, bound for the last known position of T3, which was about 120 miles from the North Pole. She is followed closely by her sister plane. After flying over an apparent endless Arctic wilderness, Ice Island T3 is sighted. Its gently undulating surface is easily distinguished from the surrounding sea ice. Most of the shoreline is characterized by cliffs from 20 to 30 feet high. The Air Force Project Icicle had landed and made a small camp on T3 17 days earlier. Snow cover of two to four feet makes ski landings necessary. Since the Air Force has started a landing strip, the P2Bs are provided with a proven landing area. This is the final test of the P2B ski installation. Since the landings at Station 5, the inboard runners have been reinforced. The skis are now highly successful. The Air Force welcomes the Navy aboard. The Air Force camp consists of a large tarpaulin-covered snow cave and several mountain tents. Three hours are spent at the camp discussing the island and its possible uses. The island is believed to be of land ice origin. Its center is about 50 feet above sea level, indicating that the island is about 400 feet thick. A decision is made for the two P2Bs to fly over the nearby North Pole. However, shortly after takeoff, one P2V experienced a valve failure and had to return to T3. Bits of fractured metal in the engine made an engine change necessary. This meant a long wait until the new engine could arrive. 
the other P2V was instructed to proceed directly to Thule so that scheduled operations might continue. The route of this plane took it from T3 to Thule and back to Point Barrow. Meanwhile, there was work to be done on T3. The Navy crew turned to and built their own quarters. Survival tents were erected and construction of a James Way hut begun. These 16-foot square huts, which resemble Quonsets, must be built on a level plot. The plywood floor sections are bolted together. Wooden frames and stringers are then put in place. And end walls are erected. The covering consists of two layers of canvas, separated by one and one half inches of fiberglass insulation. Several utility structures were built almost entirely of snow blocks. These blocks were sawed out and tailored to fit the structure. After two weeks, a new engine arrived. After four frigid days of round-the-clock man-killing work under most unfavorable conditions, the P2V is ready. She takes off on the last two phases of Ski Jump 2 and flies the 120 miles to the North Pole. A landing is not made because neither a suitable landing site nor cover aircraft is available. The P2V proceeds to Alert on the northern tip of Ellesmere Island to Thule and then back to Point Barrow. A survey of ice conditions is made along the way. And so Ski Jump 2 came to an end. The project increased the fund of information about the ice islands, about characteristics of the Arctic Ocean and its currents, and about ice conditions in the Arctic. By means of Ski Jump 2, the Navy made its final evaluation of its P2V ski installation and perfected the technique for operating heavy aircraft on unknown ice fields. looking into the eye of a tropical cyclone. From here, 40,000 feet above the surface of the Caribbean Sea, the view is striking. A huge, soft feather bed of fluffy clouds. Beautiful, you say? Don't let it fool you. Because just seven short miles below, the picture is slightly different. The usually calm tropical seas are a mass of furious, violent waves. Waves powerful enough to toss a major warship around like a toy. In 1954, more than 190 lives were lost. And property damage amounted to an estimated $755 million in the United States alone. This in a period of a little less than four months. What can be done about these disastrous storms? What can we do to control them? The answer is nothing. Suggestions have ranged from seeding the storm clouds with dry ice to dropping an atom bomb. None of these theories seem workable, though, when you consider that a single hurricane may cover thousands of square miles and contain the energy equivalent of hundreds of atom bombs. We can, however, reduce the loss of life and damage by being prepared. The answer is early warning, and this is the job of the Joint Hurricane Warning Center located in Miami, Florida. This organization, combining the efforts of the Weather Bureau, the Navy, the Air Force, and the Civil Aeronautics Administration, coordinates weather information from a vast network of communications to provide timely warnings of tropical storms in this hemisphere. Weather reports from ships at sea weather station, and reconnaissance aircraft enable expert meteorologists to analyze the development and movement of dangerous tropical storms. Since 1926, the number of lives lost has been reduced from over 160 to only 2.7 for every $10 million property damage caused by tropical storms in the United States. Although it is not known exactly what causes hurricanes, 
Past records show that the majority of storms will originate in one of these areas and generally follow a track similar to these. This is the average track of 130 hurricanes originating west of the Cape Verde Islands, traveling westward through the West Indies, curving north over the coast of Florida, and finally recurving back to sea. An average of three to five full-grown hurricanes occurs each season from June to December, with the highest frequency during the mid-August to mid-September period. The winds within a hurricane travel counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere and range from 30 miles per hour near the outer edge to 150 miles per hour or more near the eye. A full-grown hurricane is approximately 400 miles in diameter with an eye diameter of about 20 miles. The eye is the area of relative calm in the center of the storm. The Navy's contribution to the warning service includes the Fleet Weather Central, located about 15 miles from the Miami Weather Bureau office, and Airborne Early Warning Squadron 4, located at the Naval Air Station in Jacksonville. This is the famed Navy Hurricane Hunter Squadron, assigned to reconnaissance and tracking down of storms during the hurricane season, and ready to go at any time. The squadron consists of P-2V Neptune and Constellation-type aircraft manned and maintained by 245 officers and enlisted men. At the Fleet Weather Central, a 24-hour watch is kept on all suspicious weather areas. A direct line is maintained with the Weather Bureau office to coordinate weather information. Here, all reports are collected and analyzed, low-pressure areas charted. It looks like trouble has developed in this area north of Puerto Rico. Could be a bad one. A reconnaissance flight will have to be made. Flight orders are relayed by way of a second teletypewriter line to the Hurricane Squadron at Jacksonville. Here the squadron commander gets first news of the impending storm. But the sound of the teletype bell carries elsewhere too. To us, that panic bell means just one thing, trouble. It isn't long before the plane captain gets the word officially and starts rounding this up for briefing. Up in the skipper's office, the plane commander, the operations officer, and the flight aerologist show up in a hurry. There are questions to be answered. How much fuel will be needed? Where will the flight terminate? Is it going to be high or low level? These things have to be decided, and fast. Of course, if you keep up on the weather reports like most of us in the squadron do, then you have a pretty good idea of where you're going before the operations officer tells you. He also tells us that it will be low-level type flight and that the plane is scheduled for takeoff in 45 minutes. The aerologist briefs us on the general development of the storm. Since reports from the storm area indicate winds already exceed 75 miles per hour, it's now officially a hurricane. And it has a name, Thelma. Meanwhile, out on the flight line, the fuel load is being topped off and the big P2V is just about ready for takeoff. The briefing ends with a few final words from the plane commander. He outlines any deviation from the normal routine that we'll make, gives us any specific instructions, and then, good luck. If that storm is anything like it looks on paper, we'll need it. Now with the briefing over, we each have our own job to do in getting our gear together. The success of our flight can depend on having the right gear when it's needed so nobody misses a thing. Only 10 minutes before takeoff now, the special survival gear has been checked and laid out, the flight plan has been filed, and now everything is ready.
When you're out in hurricanes, there can't be any loose objects in the plane. Everything has to be fastened down, including you. With over 900 miles to go to the storm area, it's going to be a long flight. But for the flight crew, there's not much time to rest. As soon as we get underway, the radio operator has to get off a departure dispatch. Back at Fleet Weather Central, they'll be keeping track of us all the way. The navigator's job begins right away, too. A continuing plot of the plane's course has to be kept. And on a flight like this, the weather can really foul him up if he isn't careful. Even a big plane like this has a hard time staying on course in a hurricane. Down in the nose, the aerologist is getting set in his ringside seat. He has a good view from here, but believe me, he can have it. It takes a good team to fly a hurricane, and we have the best crew in the squadron. Well, anyway, we think so. To the storm area, the first signs of the hurricane appear. See those fluffy cumulus? And the sea swells won't be long now. And after a while, the rain squalls start showing up. Now the outline of the hurricane can be seen on the radar scope. Of course, the eye is still over 100 miles away, but already the winds are getting pretty rough. Nobody needs a sign to say, fasten your seat belts on this flight. Four and one half hours after takeoff time, the big 30-ton Neptune has penetrated the storm and is now just 12 miles from the eye. This is the worst part of the storm area. Waves reach mountainous proportions and winds lash the aircraft with blasts up to 150 miles per hour. Now it's a fight for survival. Every last bit of the pilot's energy is concentrated on keeping the plane low enough to see the water, but high enough to stay out of it. Suddenly, like the end of a nightmare, the plane breaks into the eye of the storm. Now, for a while at least, the struggle is over, and like a fighter between rounds, the crew relaxes. But before the return trip begins, there is much work to be done. The aerologist collects and analyzes his notes on the sea and wind conditions, the exact location of the storm center, and other facts on which the hurricane warnings will be based. Here in the eye of the storm, the seas are choppy and confused. The winds are comparatively calm, but the air is hot and humid. Now, the present position of the storm is pinpointed, and all its characteristics noted. Meanwhile, at Jacksonville, a second aircraft must be ready to relieve Crew 1, which has now cleared the storm area and is heading homeward. As long as the hurricane lasts, endangering life and property, the flights will continue. Near the end of the third day, the storm appears to be heading for land. At its present speed, it will arrive in about nine or ten hours. Only nine hours to prepare, to get the word out. The Weather Bureau is consulted. Reports are checked and cross-checked. And a coordinated warning is made up. The Weather Bureau will alert the public. And the Navy gets the word to its own ships and shore bases. Now there is no time to lose. Planes must be evacuated. Windows boarded, small boats secured, emergency water provided. Loose gear must be tied down or taken in. A child's toy can become a deadly missile in a 90 mile an hour wind. Early warning has given time to prepare. And now, there's nothing to do but wait. But at the Weather Bureau and Fleet Weather Central, there is no time for rest. The reports keep coming in, and the warnings go out. Finally, at the end of the fourth day, a break comes. The storm appears to be shifting its course. If this keeps up, the danger will be over. Now the tension subsides a bit, and as later reports confirm the change, there is relief for those who wait. Hurricane Thelma 
has changed her mind. But the weather-wise flyers of Airborne Early Warning Squadron 4 know that a hurricane is a fickle lady. They know that just as easily she may change her mind again. And so the flights go on, plane after plane, mission after mission, until the storm has dissipated or is safely out of reach. This is the job of a hurricane hunter, a service to the public, to the millions of people who depend upon the accurate and timely warnings of the Joint Hurricane Warning Service. 